So for the people who said that they do DevOps within their organization, how, how big is your company? How many people do you have? Well, at least within, yeah, within, let's say within the DevOps, do you have a dedicated DevOps team or you have a product team that contains uh, operations people? So we don't have a formal DevOps, uh, but, but we have a group of people from Dev and operations who work together very closely to build tools and do this. I mean, so that, that Dev and operations team put together would be about uh, uh, 100 people. Okay, wow. It's so, it's so funny. I mean, the, the teams that you have here are much bigger than the, the teams that I'm used to working with. Um, how about for other people who are doing DevOps? Similar. Similar? Yeah. It's about 100 people. And uh, so within your organizations, <coughs> can developers uh, push code directly to production? They can do it together with an operations person? Yes. I see. OK. Great. <coughs> Great. And I mean, that's really what it's about. It's about that, that close collaboration between uh, development and operations. I'll go through some of, the, some of that a little bit more in the presentation. So let's see. Are we ready to start? All right. Looks like we're, we're set to go. So first off, just a quick uh, introduction in terms of who I am. Um, I'm a product lead uh, at a company called Pulse Energy. Uh, by the way, this is my Twitter handle. Generally, during the talks I've been giving, I've been asking people to please tweet about um, anything that you find of interest during the talk. I'd love to get your feedback, um, and uh, I'll try and respond to, uh, to any of the questions that are raised over Twitter. Um, so this is the company that I work for, and a lot of the, um, the practices that I'm going to talk about are based on uh, my specific experience. So if you've got some questions about some of the practices or tools uh, as we go through the material, Please feel free to ask. I'm happy to go into, into detail. So yes, we do DevOps within my organization. Um, but just a, a disclaimer for me personally, as it seems like is true for most of the room, um, I'm definitely more on the development side than on the operations side. So um, I, I will, my, my perspective is going to be influenced uh, by that. And uh, this, this, this entire presentation has been inspired by Dilbert. Um, so hopefully everybody here enjoys a Dilbert cartoon. Um, specifically, this is a little joke about virtualization solving the energy crisis. I, I work for a company that does work on energy efficiency, so this kind of ap appealed to me. Um, okay, so to start with, what is what's DevOps? There's been a few a few talks about uh, DevOps so far at the organization uh, at the conference. I've attended a few. Um, but uh, I think I'll, I'll offer a slightly different flavor in terms of the definition. So really, DevOps is about, about building bridges between development and operations, trying to get them, get them to get along and work together. So, so what's the problem? Why, why is this an issue within most organizations? Um, well, the reality is that uh, it's cer certainly from the perspective of operations, and it largely tends to be true, especially where there is this division between development and operations, is that Developers don't understand the production environment. They don't know how they don't they don't understand how the code that they're building is actually running and operating within production. Conversely, ops don't understand the system. Stuff gets tossed over the wall to them. They deploy it. It falls down periodically. They know how to restart it. They may not understand really what it does. They may not understand much about the business, etc. So both sides are operating from a position of relatively limited knowledge. Anybody read this book? It's called The Goal by Ellie Goldratt. Um, it's an absolutely fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Hugely readable. Uh, it changed my perspective on a lot of things. It introduces the, the notion of the theory of constraints. Um, it, and uh, it, it's, written, it's written as a, as a, as a novel. So it's hugely digestible, very, a very entertaining read. Um, but one, one quote that I'll give you from Goldratt is he has this notion of Tell me, tell me how you will measure me, and I will tell you how I will behave. People are inherently motivated uh, based on how it is that they're going to be measured. So if we look at this, this uh, if we look at the development group and we look at the operations group, 
some of the problems associated with um, uh, their dynamic and lack of communication can be attributed to the difference in how they're measured. So if we look at de development, development is measured on features built, right? Is that true within your organization? Like, really, you're assessed as a as a development organization. You're assessed on your ability to build features on time, according to according to project plan. Whereas operation, uh, the operations group, they're measured on uptime. So they're assessed on uh, keeping systems running within the production environment. So clearly here, there is a pretty significant disparity in measurement because really, especially from the perspective of operations, and it's largely held true from experience, nothing destabilizes a production environment like a new release, right? Especially when you've got that sort of division. For, for an operations person, you're what, once, once a system has been running for a while in production, you start to feel a little bit more comfortable with it. You know, you know it's fa failure scenarios. You're able to respond to it. You get a new, a new version of the software that's being delivered. It could be failing in all kinds of uh, unknown and horrible ways that's going to keep you up at night. So it's not surprising that if you're on the operations side of the organization, and given how you're measured, me being measured on uptime, that you'd be resistant to allowing new deployments to come into your environment. Conversely, for development, I mean, often we're not really assessed in terms of what, what the uptime is like. That, that's, that's ops's job to deal with. So we need to do something in order to align those two uh, modes of measurement. Um, and I, I th a big part of building a DevOps culture is about establishing a, uh, a, a measurement regime that ensures that um, this split dynamic can be overcome. So some practices, as a, re as a result of some of these uh, problems associated with uh, stability within the production environment, part of it um, is uh, through change, is in the introduction of change management processes, which as Jez articulated in the, in the talk before this, are really there about uh, preventing change. You end up with practices like ITIL, um, Sarbanes-Oxley obviously also serves as a tool that keeps these two groups from working together. Perception that developers can't, uh, you want to have a split between the sanctity of the production environment that's managed by an operations group versus uh, the people that are involved in building the software. So, so this, is, this is what the, our state, the state of the union looks like within most organizations that have a separation between these two groups. So we can see very clearly that there is, that there is a problem here. Um, oh, so the, the, the Dilbert here uh, says um, there's no need to worry about uh, uh, Dogbert is, is talking. Dogbert, by the way, in this presentation represents the ops guy. Dilbert is the dev guy. Uh, so Dogbert's saying there's no need to worry about server virtualization project. In phase one, a team of blind monkeys will unplug unnecessary servers. And in phase two, the monkeys will hurl software at whatever is left. Voila. So... The key, the, the key uh, takeaway, sh in, in my perspective, is that we're all monkeys. It doesn't matter if we're on the dev side, we're on the ops side. At the very least, we have that in common. Um, and we'll come back to the, uh, to, to the monkeys a little bit later. So what we want to do with DevOps is we want to tear down that wall that exists between development and operation. So here's the dev guy saying, I want change, I want stability. We want to break that down and bring back the love between these two groups so that they're collaborating effectively together. And ultimately, that means bringing back the agility. Anybody know who this is? Uh, sorry? It's Richard Simmons, yeah, yeah. The definition of agility right there. OK, so why introduce DevOps into an organization? This is great and all, but why, why bother doing it? Um, so I'll give you three reasons. One is if you're in an organization that is facing competitive pressure, you want to be able to uh, outcompete your uh, competitors, which means being able to go faster, deploy features into the hands of customers at, uh, uh, as soon as possible. Um, the other is if you're in an organization that has technology as a business driver. So what that means is that if you're using new and innovative technology, let's say you're, you, you want to try out some NoSQL databases, um, the development side of the organization may not have a, a good understanding of the operating characteristics of the, those types of technology, 
nor will the operations group. These two groups really need to be able to work together in order to, to properly uh, understand the best way to deploy these types of technologies. Um, I mean, I, within my organization, uh, we've recently uh, switched from a, uh, a SQL store using MySQL to Cassandra. And um, as a result, there was a, there was a tremendous amount of learning. I mean, the initial way that we structured our schemas within Cassandra uh, turned out to be terrible from a production perspective. Um, and uh, and uh, as, as a result of, of learning and observing the operation of the system in production, we were able to uh, evolve that to make it much, much more performant. And that required a fairly significant change to the, the design. It wasn't something like just adding on additional indexes. It was completely uh, restructuring the way that we stored the data. Um, and the third thing is just really wanting to know how things work within production. I mean, I, I've worked with uh, a lot of developers. I was certainly in this position before where uh, really just responsible for for building stuff up, I had no idea what it was like, how, how the things that I built actually operated within production. And having that insight is hugely valuable. I, as a developer, I think it improved, um, it improved my, uh, my ability to build software significantly by understanding, uh, uh, under, better understanding the characteristics of the, of the software that I was building. So where does DevOps come from? Um, there are three main drivers that have brought DevOps into the marketplace. Uh, the first thing has come from WebOps. So it's primarily used within organizations that are building web applications. And so the fact that most of the people in this room are involved in building web products is obviously, obviously a good thing. It means that you're, you're well aligned for this. It's not to say that this is the only place that's applied, but many of the tools and practices, certainly the stuff that I'll be talking about, um, come from uh, the, the, the web domain. So it's come out of organizations like this, Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, Netflix, Flickr, Etsy, that um, are all deploying extre extremely frequently into their production environment. So they just can't afford to have significant barriers between their development organization and their operations organization. And they're operating at tremendous scale, far, far greater scale than uh, I assume most of us are operating in within this room, unless one of us works for one of these organizations. So another another uh, motivator for, for for DevOps is the advent of uh, of cloud hosting or managed hosting. Um, what that means in a, in a traditional uh, stru um, in a tr traditional deployment structure, we've got operations really needs to understand um, the uh, the configuration uh, of hardware, the management of racks. Um, the installation of uh, the operating system, etc. Um, so there's there's a, a deep set of knowledge there that is quite um, quite different from the knowledge associated with developing uh, an application. Whereas moving into an environment where uh, like a managed host environment or a cloud a cloud hosted environment, um, a lot of the, the, those lower level details are now being outsourced. They're being taken care of by somebody else, which means that um, that really for, for somebody uh, operating in this environment, you really need to be able to understand things from the operating system level up. And normally, you're working with a, a virtualized image that um, if you're working in, let's say, in a managed host environment, you may not have to worry about patching your machines because that's provided as a service by the vendor. So you can really focus at, at a higher level. Um, so that, that's definitely one thing that's facilitated this, uh, this movement just because of the fact that the, the knowledge overhead um, for somebody entering into this type of position has decreased. And the third reason is the advent of agile and uh, lean software development methodologies that have really uh, ha um, put a strong focus and built a set of practices around being able to release software very frequently. So in my, in my company, we're, we're not in the 10 deploys per day uh, sort of uh, environment, but we, we deploy uh, once our software once or twice a week. So, and really what this is, from a, from a lean perspective, what we're looking at is extending the value stream. So thinking about um, our overall delivery uh, organization more holistically, thinking about it end-to-end, -end, going right from inception through to the cost of supporting and maintaining applications within production, and looking for ways in which um, cycle time and, uh, and lead time can be, uh, can be compressed. 
Um, and uh, you can see the application of some of the practices that are within the, um, the Agile canon being applied now to uh, operations. So you have things like test-driven architecture or test-driven infrastructure where, uh, where operations people are basically doing TDD of, uh, of the provisioning of, um, of their servers, of the deployment of applications. So, and there are tools that, um, that are now available such as Chef and Puppet in order to support this type of activity. So you see these types of ideas that are crossing over from, uh, from uh, the development organization, which is really where Agile and Lean have first been um, uh, embraced into the, uh, into the operations side of the organization. Um, and if you're looking for more information, uh, Jez's book is a great place to start. I have to, I have to uh, pimp his book a little bit. Um, but uh, it, it is a good read. I recommend it. So um, it sounds like many people here already are doing DevOps. For, but for the rest of us who have not, don't have DevOps within your organization, how do you go about starting to make this sort of change? Um, and I'm going to talk specifically about the experience in my organization. So your, your mileage may vary within your organization. There may be uh, significant additional barriers for you to overcome. But hopefully this will give you some ideas. So the way that I've look, look at it and have distilled it down is that DevOps really comes down to uh, the implementation of five principles. There's accountability. So where does accountability lie? Who's accountable for, um, for supporting applications in production? Transparency. So how are systems actually operating? Uh, consistency. For this to be maintainable, we need to ensure that we've got a consistent environment that we're deploying into. Um, redundancy, we want to have sufficient uh, re resiliency within our production environment so that we can tolerate some level of failure. And then the last is, is leverage. So a big part of what makes this possible now is that there's a tremendous amount of, uh, of tools um, to support uh, um, automating this type of a process, which makes it um, easier for teams, smaller teams, to, uh, to be able to, to, to roll out themselves. So if we start with accountability, um, what are some of the practices associated with improving accountability? Well, the first one um, is that developers are responsible for deploying. So there was a quote from um, Werner Vogels in, in Jez's talk where uh, Werner says, uh, you know, if you build it, you, uh, you deploy it, you support it, you run it, exactly. So um, aligning that responsibility. Um, is obviously key from an accountability perspective. It's no longer something you can just chuck over the wall to the operations group. You're in it together. You build it, you run it. Um, now supporting that is, is ensuring that you've got an automated process for doing deployment. Um, and that's often, it's often, it, it's a fantastic practice to have to put in place and it's often easier than people expect. Um, it just requires a, 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 bit of, a bit of slack, a bit of investment. Um, one thing that we do within my organization, actually one, one thing I should say about fully automated deployment is that if, if you are in an organization where there is a division between development and operations, it can be difficult to do this directly within the production environment. So a great place to start is um, automating your deployment into test. This, it's hugely valuable, especially as um, you can, if you can then take that and deploy it into production, that means effectively every deploy that you do within your test environment, you are testing the same process that you would to do a, a production deployment. Um, hugely valuable. Um, and it's something that uh, having done uh, at a few organizations, I would insist as being mandatory going forward. How many people work at an organization where uh, getting new builds into your test environment is something that requires manual effort? OK, so a, a few people here. Um, so for the people who didn't put up their hands, so presumably yours is automated, how many people are doing continuous deployment into test? Awesome. And, th and that, was, that was another thing that, assuming that you, um, that you have uh, infrastructure that allows you to support it, that was another huge uh, benefit for us that we, when we introduced continuous deployment into test, it just meant there, that there was no longer this thought about, I've just checked in a change. Is it running within the test environment? It almost always was, almost immediately. 
so what that meant was the, um, the feedback cycle between developers and between testers reduced considerably. And for developers to be then have a, an external environment that they can go and then test the feature that they've just been working on developing was, was really great. So it's a great way to accelerate your process. Get it working within the environment that you control. You can demonstrate it to operations and then go from there. You had a question? Absolutely, which I think, okay, I'll come to that in just a sec, but uh, zero downtime deployment is, uh, is definitely um, facilitates this because what you don't want to be doing is, um, is disrupting any sort of testing activities that are happening within that test environment. Um, but you, you, you consider it, you don't want to be doing that when you're deploying into production either. And uh, if you have to bring down your, uh, your site every time you do a deployment, that's obviously going to uh, limit the number of times that you can deploy into production. You can only deploy at certain times of day where there's low traffic, it needs to be scheduled up front, et cetera. Whereas if you can do it in a way that is completely transparent to people using it, then that's fantastic. And so doing this within your test environment means that you are effectively testing that, that zero downtime process on a continuous basis before, uh, that go, before you, you test it out on your users when you go into production. But why? why? Why would they want to, if, if that change is actually going to go into production, why would they want to defer accepting that functionality? If you're deploying continuously as well, each change is very tiny. It's just a small increment of new functionality. So the odds are they're, they're not even going to notice as they're going through and testing. Um, at, at least that's been our experience. Sometimes it's this occasional thing where um, you, know, you go to a new page and there's a new button. Something small, right? Um, but it's, it, and it does require some adaptation on behalf of the testing organization to become, to become more comfortable with this. So what happens if you ask them at the end of the cycle whether they have tested this build completely end to end? The answer is going to be no. That's true. But often what, at least, so what we, we do, so we do a, a, weekly, uh, a weekly production release. So. Um, like I think most organizations, our, our tolerance for change shrinks over the course of the week until we get close to our production environment where we've got uh, a version of the application that's running in the test environment that's not changing very frequently. Um, and so that gives us much more confidence. And to, at a certain point in time, you can even just declare a, a code freeze. Um, so, and then the, then the issue becomes reducing the, t the, the time associated with uh, doing your regression testing. Um, but at that point in time, uh, given the fact that the ch there have been relatively few changes, from a testing perspective, you should have tested the majority of the application up until that point, and then so you can just validate the few areas that have changed within the last couple of commits that have come in before the release. So one thing that, that we do internally is uh, with the developers have a daily support rotation. So it's very clear who on the team is going to be responsible for supporting uh, our production environment on that specific day. I mean, it just means who's, who's the first point of call for that, um, let's say for that team, that system, et cetera. Um, and so that, that's part of building this accountability within the organization. One, one, one thing from a, a culture change perspective is it means that uh, by, by, by introducing more of a DevOps process, it means that um, Developers are going to move a little bit more out of their comfort area. They're going to learn more about uh, production systems. They're going to learn more about deployment processes. Um, normally, I found that it's something that developers are quite happy to, to take on. It's, it's a great additional skill set to acquire. Conversely, operations are going to learn more about uh, the, syst the, the system, the features in the system, how it's changing, what the customers value. So it's, it can be very beneficial on both sides. Uh, but it does mean having a, more of an open mind and being willing to take on responsibilities that may be outside of your traditional job description. Um, and so uptime is everybody's responsibility. 
Um, so there needs to be visibility into that. Um, zero downtime deployment, so this is what we were just talking about earlier. Um, how many people do zero downtime deployment with their, with their systems? Okay. Um, so for the people who do not do zero downtime deployment, what, what's, what obstacles do you face to doing zero downtime? Uh, so how many um, how many web servers, how many application servers are you deploying into? Uh, we have quite a few. We have uh, the application is generating multiple small web apps. So mm -hmm. we have about uh, uh, 15 to 20 web apps running on our server. Mm -hmm. So there may, be, there may be like six containers in which there are three apps each or something like that, but around 20 core applications. And so presumably you have a load balancer sitting in front of yes. those application servers, right? So um, do you have the ability to incrementally? Yes, that we do. That's the only strategy we have for zero time deployment. Then we, so we do actually daily elevations to production for small stuff. Okay. So uh, we bring down one node. Yep. Uh, load balancer goes off, puts it there, and then do the other one. So then, what what is what's the barrier to zero downtime? Uh, I think QA still doesn't support that. Okay, but then so it's not a technical barrier, right? You, you, what you're telling me is that you don't actually. If I was using the system during that period of time, my my usage would not be interrupted. Yeah. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Production, yes. In production. So, but what about the test environment? So, test environment, we typically don't have as many nodes. Some applications are in a single lab mode, and you know, that, that difference is the problem. So, that's, that's the first thing. Obviously, having, you can't do zero downtime unless you've got at least some level of redundancy on the application server level. Um, now, the one, one barrier that I've seen is, uh, you know, we're, we're a, a small dev shop, we're a small uh, product shop, we don't have the budget to get a hardware load balancer. Um, so what you can do instead is introduce uh, a lightweight uh, a web server proxy put in front of it. We use Nginx, um, and uh, it makes it very easy to, in fact, we, we, we use Nginx in production to do exactly the same thing. We don't actually try and pull servers in and out of uh, the, um, the load balancer pool in production because depending on the load balancer that you're using, it may, it may have limited support for, uh, for automation. Whereas uh, using a, uh, a reverse proxy server like Nginx is, is very scriptable and so it makes it very easy to, to just instruct Nginx to, to pull, pull the servers in and out of the pool that it's, uh, that it's sitting in front of. Um, so another problem for accountability when in, within DevOps is, uh, depending on you know, whether or not developers have deployment responsibility, is that you need to share access information more broadly in terms of uh, things like passwords for different production systems. Um, and so then, then the issue becomes, well, where do, you, where do you put those passwords? How do you manage that information across the organization? Uh, we use a, a third party tool called PassPack. Um, so it's a, it's a hosted web application. It's designed to be extremely secure. Um, and that's where all of our passwords go. And everybody within the team has access to it. Um, so we can, um, and so that's a central point for managing the passwords anytime they change. You can just very easily go in and, and see what's there. Um, and you can restrict access to different, different individuals. Uh, it's free up to a certain number of passwords. So, Many of the tools that I'm going to talk about during this presentation are free, or at least uh, are freemium. So there are things that you can go and try immediately after you uh, leave the session, or at least when you get back to work. Um, so shell access becomes a bit of a, a bit of an issue. So if you are doing deployments, how do you get into a uh, into a server in order to either do a deployment, uh, assuming it's not automated, uh, um, or how do you do some uh, diagnosis? Um, so the approach that we take, and maybe most of you do the same, is that, um, uh, that um, all, all developers on the team have got um, SSH access, shell access to any of the servers, uh, all done through uh, uh, public-private keys. Um, but they're effectively, when you enter, you're in a jailed account. And the only way that you can do anything uh, that is privileged is through executing sudo, which would, at that point in time, require you to enter a password. So, <coughs> It's quite, it's quite a secure way of, um, 
of giving access to a larger number of people within your organization, because this is often an, an, an impediment to introducing, um, introducing DevOps, a technical impediment uh, nonetheless. But um, giving more people access to production systems is something that many organizations want to control. And there are processes that you can put in place that will make it safe and are auditable. We're, we are, uh, we implement I, ISO 29001. And uh, so these practices are compliant with that. Um, and, uh, and so one of the, the key things is then a focus on, on measuring user value. So in terms of what it is that, the, from, from the operations perspective, instead of strictly looking at operations metrics and uptime, um, starting to track uh, true business value metrics through, uh, through the systems that are deployed are, is also part of elevating accountability. So transparency is next. Um, so one of the things that we have within our project team area is we have a great big status board. So an LCD monitor that's mounted on the wall that is visible to everybody on the team that's got information. It's really the, um, uh, it's, it's the, the center point for the team. So on it we have information about things like our, um, uh, our, our, our story pipeline, so how many, how many stories or issues uh, are being worked on at that given point in time, status of our, uh, our build pro automated build processes, um, information about uh, the production systems, so different op operational metrics, um, and uh, other sorts of information. We have a commit log, et cetera. Having one of these information radiators within your environment that, pre that presents uh, um, the metrics that you care about within the team especially uh, cross-functional metrics, is, is hugely valuable. How many people have something like this within your team area? Okay, something that I encourage more people to do. It, for us to get it set up, we had just basically one person go out. We didn't ask for approval, went out, bought a monitor, installed it on the wall. We built a small, we, we, this is something that we built internally. Um, it's just a very simple web page that issues some, uh, um, some AJAX requests to uh, different, sy different, uh, different systems within our ecosystem uh, to pull them together into a single place. But it's su super, super stupid simple. Um, but you can t tend to build some of these things quite quickly. Though there are some third party tools that, um, that are available for purchase, things like uh, Gecko, Gecko Dashboard. There's a few other, other kind of tools of their ilk that you could leverage to get one of these things fully formed if you don't want to have to build it yourself. Um, so in terms of transparency, a big part of it is having appropriate system monitoring in place. Um, so here are some of the tools that we use um, to, to monitor our production systems. And the key thing is measuring not just uh, system level metrics, but also application level metrics and business level metrics. So we use uh, Ganglia, um, Scout, and Monit. Uh, we've recently switched to StatsD and Graphite. Um, but uh, anybody use any of these tools to, to monitor your production systems? Traverse? Okay, haven't heard about it. Do you, do you recommend it? Uh, I don't have as much experience with it to recommend it, but our ops guys are The key the thing, though, is ensuring that any of these monitoring systems, the developers on the team also have access to. And ideally, it's displayed within your status board so that you don't have to go into an application in order to be able to track these metrics. You can. I mean, obviously, it's essential. If there, are pro if there is a problem, you want to be able to go and diagnose the problem, that you can go in and get uh, richer access. But at least at a high level, you want to know whether or not there's any problems. Being able to pull information out of these systems in a way that can be easily uh, and visibly consumed is fantastic. Uh, so this is what Ganglia looks like. Uh, we've actually moved. As I was saying, we've moved off of Ganglia to Graphite. Um, I think I've got a, a screenshot of Ganglia. Um, Scout is, so unlike, so Ganglia you host yourself. Um, Scout is a software as a service uh, application. Um, it's, uh, it's designed to integrate very well with Ruby on Rails applications. Um, and uh, they provide a, a nice hosted application that allows you to create charts from your, your metrics. Um, the, what we found was, or as we added more servers, and we've now added a very large number of servers, um, it became uh, no longer cost effective. Uh, but I think that they also have a freemium model. So if you're looking for something that, to just get up and going quickly 
where you don't want to have the overhead of installing one of these systems yourself, it's quite a nice way to get started. With all of these systems, generally the way that they work is there's a daemon that's running on each machine that's collecting metrics either directly from the system or metrics that are being posted to it. And then they will transmit them through to some sort of a, an aggregation service um, with a web application on top of it that you can then go and consume the results. Uh, so this is uh, StatsD and Graphite. Um, yeah, it's basically, Graphite is an evolution of Ganglia. So if you were to consider Ganglia versus Graphite, just go with Graphite. StatsD comes out of, uh, who, who's doing StatsD? Twitter, I think. Um, site monitoring. So, so not only do you want the, the, the low-level operational metrics, um, but having some sort of a third-party service that can assess whether or not your application is running. Um, so running outside of your data center and trying to get in is, obvious, is key. For this, we use a service called Pingdom. Anybody use or heard of Pingdom before? Okay, uh, go and, and create an account after, after this and try it out. You get a, a number of pings uh, available for free. But what it does is it, from, from they, they've got, uh, I don't know, 50, 60 data centers that they're deployed into around the world. And you provide it with a URL and it will ping that URL or will do an HTTP get from that URL um, on an interval that you can specify. As, as short as one minute, um, and if it doesn't get a response, um, and it verifies that it doesn't get a response from a few different locations around the internet, so you know that it's not just kind of some sort of a localized outage in a specific area, then it provides you with an alert. Um, and that alert can come to your email, it can go to your, your phone by SMS. Really great tool and uh, has got a great freemium model. Um, Uh, but you filter it out. They, they use a custom user agent, so you can you can very easily keep that out of your um, uh, out out of your web analytics system. And really, I mean, it's 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 a limited number of pings. You can specify the interval if you're really concerned about it. But if you're concerned about that volume, then you know you, you're not looking at very high usage levels. It, generally, not something you need to worry about. But if if you are concerned. Start with less frequent monitoring. Start with, you know, once per day or once per every 15 minutes. I, I have this set up for my, my personal WordPress blog. So you don't even, if you want to try this out, you don't even need to do it at work. Try it for your own personal website. See how it works. So the other thing that's nice about this, and I showed a screenshot of it earlier, is that they provide it does free uptime reporting. So, I mean, if, if you're interested in, in calculating how many nines you have uh, for your, your product, Trying to do that yourself is a bit of a pain. They do it for free for you. Um, error notification. So how do you know whether or not an error has happened within your application? Um, so what we do is uh, we, uh, we are notified of any errors or warnings that are logged within our application. Um, so which is, uh, is a, a great practice. I highly recommend it. Uh, because what it does, how many people here uh, look at their production logs? So what, what's, what's it, when you go and look at a production log, what does it look like? Can you find stuff in your production log? If it's not something that you look at all the time, it they tend to be a terrible mess. I've gone through and, and done, ar like, done some archaeology of production logs for, um, uh, for different systems where um, people have not actively been looking at their contents. And you can see all kinds of errors in them. That, that should never happen within production. Things like you know, uh, class cast exceptions and um, obviously lots of null pointer exceptions. And people were completely oblivious. It, it didn't bring down the system, so ops didn't care about it. It affected probably you know, a handful of users, but these are errors that users should not be experiencing. They should not be experienced, or at least they should not go unfixed for a prolonged period of time. But they were because nobody ever knew about them. So what we do is, we want to know as soon as a user encounters an error, we want to know that that's happened. And so what we have, this, this is something we built internally, but this is a third party uh, software as a service application that you can use as well, um, is that we stream all of our, uh, uh, our error and warning log messages to a socket. Um, we run a little daemon 
that uh, will send an email anytime there is an error or a warning that's logged. Now we do some throttling. At first we didn't have any throttling in place and uh, we ended up getting a tremendous number of e emails because normally what happens is when, when an error happens, it doesn't happen just once. It will happen thousands of times, the same error. Will. So uh, what happened, at that point in time, we were, use, we were doing all of our email forwarding through Gmail and they blacklisted us as a source of spam. Um, so not only did we overwhelm our, uh, our inboxes, but we also, um, uh, we also made it so nobody in our organization could send emails anymore. Not something to recommend. So definitely, if you do decide to do this yourself, put some sort of throttling in place. Um, but AirBrake is a quick way to do this. Uh, basically, you, you just do an HD post of the, of the error message through to their service, and then they'll provide you with a notification about it. They do, um, and so they provide a web application that you can go in and you can look and see what the errors are. Anybody use AirBrake or Hoptoad, as it used to be? So yeah, Hoptoad. Uh, is what AirBrake got turned into, and then they've recently acquired another company that's in the same space. Um, but it's also something that you can get going with very, very quickly. Uh, so then it's, it provides an, uh, an interface that looks like this, where you've got all of your errors expressed. Um, we, one thing that, we find that AirBrake does that we don't like is that if it sends you one email about uh, an error, it won't send you a reminder about it ever again. And we find that we want to be reminded of problems because it's very easy. Like if something just fails once, it's not necessarily a big deal. But if it's happening consistently, see, consistently you definitely want to go in and take a look at it. Um, so user tracking, uh, again, the, a big part of this is the other, uh, the other principle that I'll cover a little bit later is leverage. So using third-party services so we don't have to build and deploy and host these things yourselves. Uh, so using systems like Google Analytics, KISS Metrics, or Mixpanel um, in order to provide information about user tracking is so that you know what features are being used within your application, what features are not being used, which is often more useful, um, and then be able to generate reports from that. So consistency. Um, so consistency is obviously key in order to be able to, uh, to set up uh, more of a DevOps type process. Um, one thing that's essential is having the test environment reflect the production environment. Um, and uh, let's see. And so a big part of that is ensuring that the, the provisioning configuration of those environments is done in a consistent way. And the best way to do that is to automate that process. And through the automation, that's basically code, right? So all your configuration information is code, should reside within your source control system and should be uh, treated in the same way as, 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 uh, as code. Um, so, yeah, as I said, keep it under source control. Uh, and for this, there are tools to support it, specifically Chef and Puppet. How many people here use Chef or Puppet within their production environment? What, which do you use, Chef or Puppet? puppet. Use Puppet? Well, so why, why, actually, let's see here. Why Puppet? These, these are some, we, we actually, within my company, we started with Puppet, we switched to Chef. Um, and, uh, so, so we found Chef, uh, Puppet does more, that's what I was told by the ops guys, and the trainer we had was more familiar with Puppet than Chef, so he came in with a promise that he could train us on both. Yeah. Out of two days, he spent one day and six hours on Puppet, and then last two hours, he warmed up everything on Chef. Okay. That's, that's often what I found is basically people have their biases. I mean, the systems, the, the two systems are largely equivalent, but there are some reasons to prefer one over the other. Um, so Puppet is, is, uh, uses a declarative-based syntax for uh, configuring and provisioning your production environments, which often operations people seem to be more comfortable with. Chef uh, uses a script-based approach. So basically, both of these systems are implemented in Ruby, but in Chef, you have, you ha it's, more e it, it's easier to take advantage of the features of the Ruby language um, than it is within Puppet, which from an operations perspective, you may not care about because you may not be that familiar with Ruby, whereas if you're a developer, then you are used to having those, uh, uh, the, the features of the language available. 
The other big thing that I think about uh, Puppet that makes a difference is that Puppet supports both push and pull. So by, by pull, um, that means that, uh, sorry, by push, that means that you are instructing Puppet to deploy new versions of the configuration to your environment directly, which is great if you are, if you, if you need that control because you're not confident about that process. Whereas in a, um, in a pull-based environment, you're effectively running uh, a daemon that on each server that is pulling your, uh, your central repository, so your puppet master or uh, your, your central repository for hosting your cookbooks um, for changes. And if it detects a change, it will pull that down and deploy it automatically. And so that can be a little bit scary. But push, push you can only deploy so far. I mean, really, you can only push to so many servers um, in, through, a, through a manual process. Um, Whereas, whereas pull is designed for uh, working with very large, uh, a very large uh, um, server environment. So uh, it, it's something that I've seen organizations shift to. You can definitely still do, you can do both in Puppet, uh, whereas Chef is really much, uh, much better. Um, it, it, it's, it's quite difficult to do, um, to do push with, with Chef. Um, Part of the reason that we switched as well was we, we switched from managed hosting to, uh, to cloud, cloud hosting. And um, there, at least at that point in time, there was much better um, uh, cookbook and recipe support for deploying to AWS available within, uh, within Chef instead of versus Puppet. But both flavors are good, and it's a great, they're, they're great tools to look at if you haven't already tried them out within your organization. Um, so part of this is also then integrating these types of um, your your configuration changes into your build process. So we have we have we use Team City for uh, for our automated builds, and so we have Team City projects that are set up to detect any any change any changes to our configuration repositories. So the repositories that hold our uh, our chef recipes, and then automatically. Uh, for, well, first we validate those changes, and then if they validate, then we apply those changes into our test environment. So we're, we effectively do continuous deployment of, uh, of configuration changes into our test environment. You generally don't want to do this in production, um, and so the way that we manage that is we have a, um, we, we version all our cookbooks, and uh, the version represents the, um, the configuration that's running within the production environment. Uh, or within each, within each data center. And so we go in and we update the version number anytime we want those changes to be deployed into production. Because we're using uh, a pull-based mechanism, that's sufficient for the, um, uh, for the chef demons running on each of the servers to pull down and apply those changes. Um, and uh, yeah, so anyway, you can use a lot of the same sort of processes that you that you're accustomed to using for, uh, uh, for development with your, um, your infrastructure changes as well. Uh, for remote administration, we use a tool called Capistrano. Uh, Capistrano is basically a, uh, a Ruby, Ruby library that provides uh, concurrent shell access to multiple servers. So it's basically executing the same shell commands via SSH across a large number of servers. It's, it's designed principally for deploying Rails applications. We, don't, we have one Rails application, uh, but we use it for all of our services. Um, and it's quite nice because basically what you do is you build up a library of common uh, production support related operations um, through your uh, Capistrano recipes. Anybody using Capistrano? Cool. Do you like it? Yeah. It's, it's a great tool to get started with. OK. Um, Using production data in the test environment is, again, part of consistency, ensuring that you're actually validating, um, validating production problems, uh, validating production performance within your test environment. Um, having the two reflect each other is very key. Um, now, obviously, you need to be able to sanitize that test data, or sanitize that production data before you bring it into production, um, so as to respect user privacy, and so, as, so you don't do things that I have done in the past, like uh, accidentally send emails to customers from your test environment, um, which <laughs> always produces some interesting support inquiries. How many people do this? How many people uh, use production data in the test environment? 
All right, so the, the next thing is how often do you refresh that with production data? Because that's the other side of it is to really be, to really ensure that your, uh, that your test environment uh, that, and, and what you're testing within your test environment reflects production. You want to ensure that you're refreshing that data all the time. So what we, we do, uh, we do it weekly. So we restore, um, we, can't, we can no longer restore all of our data, but we, can, we restore a good chunk of our data into the test environment on a weekly basis. So, there, so that, that'll, that means that, um, and that's an automated process. So there's a scheduled job that does it. There's um, scripts that, that, uh, that make it all happen, that take care of the sanitization so that um, it's all just done automatically. And it's very easy to put in place. Well, I'm not sure. I, what, what I've found is that there's often, it, it, it's not all the data that they're concerned about. That there is ways in which the data can be mutated so that it no, there, there, there's no longer any customer specific information um, and that the data is effectively, effectively sanitized. It does make it more difficult to reproduce production issues in the test environment. So it's not a but question of technically being able to do it. It's a legal binding. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So you may you may have you may have restrictions that are not possible to overcome, but it is it's a great thing to be able to do if you can get away with it. And in our case, through through doing uh, sanitization, we're able to do that. Hmm. One other thing I wanted to say about this is that often within environments that have long-lived testing databases, you end up with testers building up their own set of test data, which is, in my opinion, a smell. Because what that means is they are testing, every time they test, they are testing using data that they have configured themselves that may not represent actual user configuration. So the way that we discourage that is we say, you know what, if you want to set up test data that yourself, that's fine, but it's only going to live in the test environment for one week, which is aligned with our deployment cycle. At the end of that, it's all going to be cleared away. So um, you've got an incentive to ensure, as a tester, that that you that you understand you understand uh, the the actual user data, and that ideally you're testing more from the perspective of an actual user, which means you're finding problems that users would find as opposed to problems that testers would find, because it is from every organization I've worked in, developers spend a lot of time. Uh, fixing problems that users would almost never encounter just because of the fact that uh, there are problems that, uh, that, that testers encounter. Um, so one, one thing that, um, that I, I a quote from Eric Reese that I quite like is he says, um, uh, let's see, how does it go? Uh, basically, until you understand what your users value, you don't know what quality is. So Testing from that perspective of user value is 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 key, and then that really that should drive what your definition of quality is, not based on your ability to um, produce certain you know error conditions within the software that a user might never otherwise encounter. Okay, so redundancy. Um, so obviously having some some level of support responsibility and, and sharing that throughout the organization. Server redundancy we talked about a little bit. Um, uh, especially within the context of zero downtime deployment, um, which again we talked about, um, having that not only at the application level but also at the at the database level. So having database replication in place um, is also is also key. Um, I'm just trying to th see if I talk about zero zero downtime database deployment in this uh, in this deck. Um, if if not, then I'm happy to talk about that more a little bit later. Uh, one thing that we did, uh, it, this is a little bit old now, it's about a year and a half ago, but we, uh, we moved our production data center. So uh, we started out being hosted at Rackspace and we decided that we didn't want to use them anymore. Um, and, and we also had some requirements that we needed to set up an additional data center in Canada. We were able to do that whole data center move in a way that did not require any downtime to our customers. So if, if you get fanatical about this, there's, uh, it, it required planning which is one thing that's a great thing to introduce developers to into a DevOps culture. Like developers, I don't think, uh, the, the developers tend to be very uh, reactive. 
Um, you know, as a developer, you're used to working in an environment of very quick feedback. And so as a result, you can be more responsive. Whereas when you're in operations, things often need to be planned out and you need to think about contingencies and problems. And uh, bringing developers into that mindset, I think, can also be very valuable. And when you do something like uh, moving a data center or uh, failing over to a, um, to a different database or, move, or doing some sort of significant data migration, you often really have to think things through and you have to think about what needs to happen in what order especially if you don't want the site to go down and users to be affected. Um, but great additional skill for developers to have. Uh, so key part of it is having an architecture that, um, that supports being able to queue up, um, the queue up data, queue up requests, so that you can process, you can bring down servers, um, and, uh, and you're not going to lose any, any data that's being processed. And when you bring them up somewhere else, then all of a sudden you can, that data can start flowing through into your system. Um, having things like circuit breakers in place within your application. Um, how many people have read uh, Release It by Michael Nygaard? Probably one of, one of the best books I've read on, um, on system architecture. Absolutely fantastic book. And he, he, in that book, he talks a lot about um, experiences, uh, his experiences supporting, uh, building and supporting highly scalable applications. Um, and uh, it's called Release It. Release It. Um, but uh, I can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, so he talks about this pattern of circuit breakers where uh, effectively what happens is you want to have some, you want to be able to handle failures gracefully within your, within your, within your application architecture. So if, you, if you're communicating with a web service and you can no longer reach that web service after a certain number of requests, basically the circuit breaker kicks in and you no longer attempt to to make that invocation until some point later when it's deemed to be OK. Um, and so that keeps you from, especially if you've got any sort of retry mechanism, it keeps you from uh, launching denial of service attacks against your own services, um, which makes it very difficult to bring things back up after they fall down. And these are things that developers have to fix, but developers don't necessarily know about, and operations are stuck trying to restart these servers that keep going down because they're inundated with requests. From, uh, from other systems that have not properly been designed to support this type of failure. So again, tons of things that developers can learn by getting closer to the production environment. Uh, feature toggles are uh, a, big, a big thing that we use within our application. So that's selectively uh, controlling the visibility of certain features. Um, they may be turned off for all users. Let's say if we've got a feature that's, um, uh, that's, that's only partially implemented and we want to be able to continue to adhere to our weekly release cycle. Or it could be features that are released only to certain types of users. Um, so let's say we have, uh, we have a lot of super users or support users. Those features are only available or visible to them. Or uh, we can do split testing. So we can deploy, uh, we can have certain features or certain versions of features that are available to, um, to certain, uh, certain segments of our overall user population. Um, how many people do feature toggling within their application? So it's, it's something that's actually, it's surprisingly easy to set up. Effectively, really all that you need to do is have a, um, a, a little bit of metadata that you can associate with each customer that indicates what features have been enabled for that customer. So it can be achieved by basically adding one additional column if you're using a relational data store to the to your customer account record that in that just contains let's say a comma separated list of the features that have been enabled for that customer very easy and you can have a and then just implement a simple administrative interface to support turning like listing those features and then turning them on and off on a per customer basis so uh, uh, the monkey story so I said I'd come back to this um, how many people have heard of the uh, Netflix's chaos monkey Oh, good. Okay. So then this is, this is a, a new story for most people. Um, so Netflix have something that, that they run internally called the Chaos Monkey, which is a service that will go through and at random shut down different, uh, different machine instances, machine nodes, um, throughout their production data system. So 
it's, uh, it, it's, it's kind of a crazy concept, but basically what they're doing is they are continuously testing their system for re resiliency. And if, if, you, if you use Netflix, I mean, it is a fantastically reliable application and incredibly performant. It's, um, and, par and part of the way that they, they achieve that is by having tools like this that are going out and aggressively tearing things down. So it basically means that they are always simulating failure because failure is always going to happen. So, but this, this gives them some measure of control over it as well. This is, this is something they've now open sourced and if you want, if you're brave enough to, uh, to try it out, you can uh, download and install it. Hmm? Well, that's true, potentially, but I mean, really, any service within your, any node within your, uh, de your deployment and production environment could go down at any period of time. So really, that's what they're simulating. Failure will, will happen at, an, at a node level. Sure, Jez. It's also a way of testing that that building system is uh, So I, I do think that it, it does represent realistic failure scenarios that are often not validated within a test environment. You do want to be able to validate some of these things within a production environment. Obviously, it's pretty ballsy to do it. Um, you may, maybe you want to start doing it in your test environment, assuming that you've got a sufficiently large number of nodes, sufficiently uh, enough, enough redundancy. But I mean, you do want to be able to find these things out early. Um, and then if you're sufficiently confident, then do it within production. Predictability. Um, so what we've recently done is all of our DNS configuration now, re now resides in source control. So um, that's, that's great because normally the, this, this, this type of very vital inf metadata about your system, if it, it's only residing in the tool, then if anything changes, you've got no version history. You've got no ability to see who may have changed it um, and what they changed it to at a certain point in time. So getting this under version control is awesome. It's definitely something to be recommended. Um, source control. So wh why host your own source control system? For a long time, we, we were on Subversion, and we had our own Subversion repository hosted in-house. And we were like way out of date. Because no, nobody, nobody maintains these things, right? They just kind of, you set them up once and they, 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 they just work. But as a result, like, we were so, so far behind. Um, whereas moving to a hosted version control model, I mean, I think these days so many companies use GitHub because it's just fantastic. Um, that uh, it's just one of these things that you don't want to have to take care of managing yourself anymore. How, how many people host their own version control system? But you, okay, no, I'm saying host your own internally. You're using GitHub. Um, yeah. So, sorry? Subversion. You're using Subversion. Yeah. Is it because uh, scared there from the security people is like a source code for a lot of the companies? The thing is, look, look at what other companies are hosted on GitHub. There are much more valuable companies hosted on GitHub than yours. If somebody was to hack into GitHub, they're not going to, they're not going to go after your source code. They're going to go after those companies that are worth a lot more money than yours. So, um, and you know what? They're probably a heck of a lot more secure than your internal IT systems. So if somebody was really wanted to get your access to your source code, they probably have an easier time hacking into your system than hacking into GitHub to get access to it. I probably don't need to convince you, but, um, uh, but the, these, are so, like, these are some of the debates that we had internally before moving to GitHub. Um, and we found them to be pretty, that to be pretty compelling. Um, email. Email is something that most organizations look to host themselves, but there are great third-party services to do this that allow you to do basically uh, micro-level transactions. So we send all of our emails through a third-party service called Postmark. Um, again, they take care of, like we don't need to deploy and support email servers. Um, they provide redundancy. They provide, like for something like email, you want to, you don't want to have to deal with um, uh, anti anti spam uh, verification, and, like worrying about getting blacklisted, etc. These services are set up to take care of it, um, and so you know normally you might have an operations person that would be stuck worrying about all these things. You can outsource them to a third party uh, for a fraction of what you would have to pay your operations staff to do it. Customer engagement, so. 
again, like getting customer feedback. There are third-party services to do this uh, using things like Get Satisfaction, User Voice, uh, or Salesforce. Um, even the provisioning services themselves uh, are outsourceable. So we, I, as many people who use Chef, um, host their cookbooks up on ops code because we don't want to have to we don't want to have to be running our own puppet master instances we we can uh, have a third party deal with that well because of the fact that we're notified about failures as soon as they happen um, that uh, we very rarely actually go into the logs unless they're unless there is insufficient information within um, those emails. But as a result, what happens is, uh, because of the fact that we get this pushed to us directly, it provides a direct incentive to ensure that you've got as much information in those, uh, those warning and error messages to make it possible to reproduce the problem outside of your environment. Um, first, then the app server's not going to work until those database changes have been applied. Conversely, if you upgrade the database first, then that's going to bring down the version of the application that's running in, in your environment because it can't work with the new, data, with the, the new schema changes. So what do you do? Well, okay, alter table, change column, blah, 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 from this name to this name. You know, how, how, do, you, how do you execute that statement? Um, as, soon as, you make, as soon as you run that statement, you're going to bring down the application. Um, and, but the new version of the application depends on the new column name. So how do you do it? How, how, would, you, how would you do this? With how bring down your application? Then create new column, and then once the migration is done, then talk to you. Exactly, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's the, the key idea, is that inserting a column is an expansion operation. Because I mean, depending on your, uh, your, your data access logic, your object relational mapping framework, most of them will be resilient to a new column being added to a table that they don't know anything about. right? Um, so you can insert that column, and that will not affect the version of the application that's running. You can then upgrade to the new version of the application that will start using. Uh, it, it, how many people use like a uh, uh, an automated database migration framework when applying uh, database upgrades? So something like dbDeploy, which is a terrible antiquated framework that I would encourage you not to use um, unless you have DBAs that are terrible. Um, but uh, yeah, did anybody use something else other than dbDeploy? No? Does anybody, have, for people who aren't using dbDeploy, how do you do your database upgrades? You've been adding a new column. Yeah, let, let's, say, let's, say, let's say you needed to add a column to the table. How do you do it? Do you use migration? Yeah, you do use migration. OK. Um, you, I mean, really, it's, they're so simple that you don't actually need a framework around it. Um, but uh, okay, I, 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 it's a digression to get into uh, database migration frameworks. Um, but the key thing is, uh, yeah, just having basically two folders that contain one folder that contains expansion migrations, one folder that contains cleanup migrations. You run the expansion migrations first, and then through your automated deployment script, you then run the cleanups. And you may want, like, what we do is because of the fact that. Because running a cleanup migration will break backwards compatibility, if you're at all concerned about rollback, then you may want to run those cleanups at some point later. Um, so, uh, so, and really you can run it at any point after the release happens. The other thing that's quite nice about it um, is that uh, we, we will add cleanup migrations for uh, um, for tasks, any sort of data related tasks that are in the database. So, because cleanups can effectively be run any time outside of a deployment that will not affect any system version of the application, we can add a cleanup and then just run it against production directly without needing to deploy any version of the application. So, you know, th this is like one of these super stu stupid, simple concepts that when you present it to people, they go, well, that would never work. Because, you know, what about data inconsistency? What about you know? What about this type of operation? What about this type of operation, etc. Um, we've been doing it for two and a half years and have never really encountered any significant problems for doing it. And the key thing that I encourage you to do is just try it out. Like for when you get that type of pushback, just say you know, let's just try this. You know, it, it's there, what, there's no harm in terms of us, except building our migrations like this. 
So, and uh, yeah, I, I guarantee you it will, it will uh, make a big difference. Um, and it will allow you to change your database more, more frequently, unless you have DBAs. So going back to DB deploy, so part of the reason that um, I don't like DB deploy is that you have to consider the context that DB deploy was designed for. So DB deploy was designed to produce SQL as an output that would be given to a DBA to run against a production database. So it's assuming that that is your context. If there is a DBA that that has got a firewall around the database, and they're the only ones who will run migrations, and they want to go through and hand check the SQL statements in order to make sure that they make sense. If you don't have that context, then don't use DB deploy. Um, what is far more powerful is to use a migration framework that actually supports scriptability, where instead of requiring the output to be um, you know, to be a SQL statement. You can do things like, your migration is just the execution of a script. And within that script, that script can be written in any language. We use Python, we, we actually use a, a Groovy-based migration framework called Bering that's a port of uh, uh, Rails, uh, Rails migrations to, uh, to the Java platform. Um, but uh, within that script, you can do things like, okay, I want to pull in some columns and then do some manipulation, or so pull in some rows, do some manipulation, um, uh, and, uh, and then do some updates in the database. So, which is something that you can't produce a SQL script for because it's going to be based on, it's, it needs to be based on the data that's actually in the database. So that's one reason not to use it. Um, and another thing, like running a script, if you want, you don't have to produce SQL. You could, in fact, um, and this is the key idea with Rails migrations, is that you could be invoking your domain objects directly and do the database manipulation through your, your application server. Um, which, uh, if you're using, let's say, a NoSQL store, that's actually quite a nice thing to be able to do. Um, which is one of the things that we do. Anyway, so that's, that's kind of the the key idea there. It seems so simple that it can't work, but it does. Um, the only, the, the uh, well, I mean, this is this is generally a challenge with doing database migration. If you have very large tables and you need to, uh, to need to migrate them, then there are considerations that need to be taken into account. So if you are like adding or deleting columns and that can block those block those tables. Um, uh, so you may want to choose selectively in terms of when, when to run those operations. And more often than not, um, the, if, you, if you want to do zero downtime, the best approach is to, if for large tables, is to actually, rather than attempting to manipulate the structure of that table, is to create a new table. And then migrate all the data across um, that has the new structure. And then you start using it. Anyway, that's, I, th I think we're, we're probably at a time right now. But uh, thanks for sticking around. And uh, yeah, thanks for sharing your experiences.